Hello, I'm Ashish Arora. I'm working as a senior scientist at the Molecular and Structural Biology Division of CSIR Central Drug Research Institute. Now for the EPG Partshala, I'll present to you Paper 8 Medical Physics and Module 21, which deals with FTNMR instrumentation, RF transmission. The objectives of this module are to explain to you what are the components of an FT-NMR spectrometer? What kind of magnet is used for NMR? How is the magnetic field stabilized? What is field frequency lock? What is a probe? How is the pulse generated? And what are gradient shims? FT-NMR instrumentation. An FT-NMR spectrometer consists of the following components. A console with host, and spectrometer computers for controlling the operation, a high field magnet, usually a superconducting persistent magnet, field frequency lock, room temperature shim coils or shims, components for RF generation and amplification, where RF is radio frequency. The probe with single or multiple channels, multiple channel means that different channels are tuned to different nuclei with different gyromagnetic ratios. Preamplifier and mixer, receiver with mixer and analog to digital converter or ADC. FT as you know means Fourier transformation. FT NMR is a pulsed Fourier transformation NMR spectrometer. In the figure is schematic of an NMR spectrometer. On the top right corner, you see a magnet in which a probe is inserted. At the bottom of the probe, you see a box labeled as pre-amplifier and then you have other boxes labeled as transmitter and receiver. The console has the electronics that generates the pulse of required radio frequency. The probe is inserted into the magnet and the sample is inserted into the probe and the radio frequency pulse is applied to the sample. The signal that is generated by the sample is observed by the observe coil and is immediately pre-amplified with the pre-amplifier being very close to the probe. That signal is then reduced and it goes to a mixer and then subsequently through other circuits before it, it is digitized and stored in memory. Let us go through various comp components of an MR spectrometer. First, we have host and spectrometer computers. By host computer, what one means is that an MR spectrometer is controlled by a dedicated spectrometer computer. The spectrometer computer is instructed by the operator via general purpose host computer workstation. Earlier there used to be Sun workstation, now basically we can use Linux based workstations. The workstation also communicates with the console and this console has the spectrometer computer. Additional processors perform specific functions under the master timing and control of the spectrometer computer. The data acquisition computer implements a pulse programming language to permit the user to control the pulse programmer. And this comes in the form of various softwares. The processing computer performs digital signal processing of the recorded time domain signal to produce the frequency domain spectrum. So basically what you see here are the older sun computers with screens and with various FIDs or you see the 1D spectrum and 2D spectrum of uh, Varian, Agilent, Geol and Broker NMR spectrometer. Superconducting magnet. The magnet is responsible for generating the intense B0 field. Modern spectrometers use superconducting electromagnets operating in the persistent mode. The magnet consists of a heavy non-magnetic stainless steel casing that houses two DVRs that are vacuum sealed and thermally insulated by evacuation 
and maintenance of high vacuum. The room temperature bore of the magnet is centered on the Z axis of the solenoid coils. The magnet solenoid coils are made from niobium and titanium or niobium and tin. The superconducting coils are housed in the inner DVAR and are cooled with liquid helium which is necessary to make them superconducting. Cryoshims. In addition to the main coil which is cooled in liquid helium, a superconducting magnet contains additional superconducting coils called as cryoshims which produce specific magnetic field gradients that improve the basic homogeneity of the main coil. The helium cooled coils are charged through a power supply and a programmed charging routine with approximately 100 amps current. After charging, the magnet runs in the persistent mode that is with no connection to a power supply. This is done by putting a shorting plug between the joints which connect different superconducting wires. The small resistance of the plug and the joints lead to gradual reduction of the magnetic field. This is called as the field drift which is of the order of 1 to 10 hertz per hour. Outer DVAR of a superconducting magnet. The liquid helium DVAR is surrounded by a thermal radiation shield a vacuum space and an outer DVAR. The outer DVAR is filled with liquid nitrogen to lower the boil off rate of helium from the inner DVAR. By helium I mean liquid helium. The liquid nitrogen and liquid helium levels are monitored with level meter probes and they have to be replenished periodically before the level falls before, below a certain value. For sustained operation of the magnet, these levels have to be continuously replenished. A superconducting magnet has fringe or stray fields which are effectively shielded in modern magnets. It is important to mark the 5 Gauss stray field region for safety considerations. The magnet is put on legs that have an anti-vibration system of pressurized air cushion to make the operation free from vibrations. Assembly and safety concerns of a superconducting magnet. The magnet has a central bore which may be wide or narrow. At CDRI, we have narrow bore magnets. Narrow bore magnets are more suited for solution NMR work whereas a wide bore magnet is used for solid state or for imaging purposes. From the bottom side of the magnet, the room temperature shim assembly is introduced and these shims will be explained later in this lecture. An upper barrel is introduced from the top of the magnet. The probe is inserted from the bottom through the center of the room temperature shims and is directed through a groove to plug into the upper barrel and is logged in place with screws at the bottom. Present generation magnets have field homogeneities or inhomogeneities on the order of 1 part in 10 raised to the power 9 or parts per billion. Medical devices such as neurostimulators and cardiac pacemakers can be affected by stray magnetic fields that surround the magnet and such devices and people having them should stay beyond 5 Gauss line. The unexpected loss of superconductivity results in a quench of the magnet. This rapidly releases large quantities of helium gas that can displace the oxygen from the magnet room. Usually a quench happens at the time of installation and cooling down and charging of the magnet or because of mishandling. Now in these figures you see different magnets. Uh, there is an Oxford magnet shown on left. Then in the middle there is a cross section of the magnet, uh, various uh, compartments and then on the right you have a schematic of the magnet which shows you the solenoid coils, which shows you the probe inserted from bottom 
and the upper barrel is assembly and in blue what you see is the spinner and in the middle of it you have the NMR sample tube. You can see the inner divar which is and the liquid helium fill port and the outer divar and the liquid nitrogen fill ports. The strongest working superconducting magnet in the world is a Bruker 23.5 superconducting magnet which is part of the most powerful NMR spectrometer in the world which is at Lyon in France. Next slide please. Now room temperature shim coils or shims. The natural magnetic field of a superconducting magnet even after putting in the cryo shims is not sufficiently homogeneous for high resolution spectroscopy. Magnetic fields are produced by a set of specially designed auxiliary room temperature electromagnets to compensate the inhomogeneity of the main static field. The electromagnets generate additional magnetic fields with spatial variation described by various spherical harmonic functions and magnitudes proportional to applied electric currents. The coils of electromagnets are called as shims and the process of adjusting the homogeneity of magnetic field is called as shimming. This process is necessary before starting any experiment as a homogeneous magnetic field obtained by proper shimming ensures the proper shape and sharpness of the resonance peak. It also enhances the intensity of the resonance peaks. So before we start any experiment, we put in the sample, we let it equilibrate and after that we do shimming of the sample. There are axial and radial shims. The room temperature shim coils are contained within the room temperature bore of the magnet between the main magnet and the probe. Typically 30 different room temperature shims are available. Axial shims Z1 to Z7 change the field along the Z axis or the Z axis and can be adjusted with the sample spinning at approximately 20 hertz. Radial shims depend on the X and Y coordinates and must be shimmed with a non-spinning sample. The shims are also defined in terms of their order. Z, X and Y are termed as the first order shims. Z square, ZX, ZY and XY are second order shims. And then you have Z3, X3, Y3, Z2Y, Z2X and ZXY and so on. And they are the third order shim. At the time of installation, the shims are adjusted through 3D gradient shimming routines. Improvement of homogeneity by shimming. The improvement in homogeneity is monitored by one of the following three procedures. As the shimming improves, there is an increase in the height of the lock signal about which we will learn. The absorptive deuterium signal becomes sharper as the homogeneity increases and therefore it its height increases. Second, the shape of the FID. When the frequency is set to that of the solvent, the FID of the solvent does not show any oscillations and decays as a single exponential. And the third, the line shape. Line shapes are measured with standard samples, typically 1% chloroform in D6 acetone. The full width is examined at 50%. 0.55% and 0.11% of the peak maximum. Corresponding line widths of 0.5, oblique 5, oblique 8 hertz indicate optimum shimming for a non-spinning sample. Spinning the sample can improve the line shape but at the same time introduces instabilities which may compromise the performance of multidimensional NMR experiments and may also introduce artifacts. The shims have to be adjusted in an interactive fashion usually by, form, by following a particular order or shimming protocol. And here one of the shimming protocol is shown schematically. So at the left you know at the top we start, we lock the spectrometer and then we try to change the Z and Z square shims. Then we go to the lower order shims X, XZ, 
y, y z, x y n, x square minus y square. We repeat it once, then we tune the probe and adjust log phase once again and then we change the z, z square, z cube, come back to z, then we go to z4, come back to z square, then we go to z4, z3, z, z5, z3, z. Normally we would change shims from z1 to z6. Uh, and after we have done, so these are the axial shims, after we have done that, then we would change the radial shims xz, x, z and then we again go through the axial shims z and z square. We change the y, z, y and z shims. Then again we touch z and z squares. Then we go to x, y, x and repeat it and then the remaining till we get a very good line shape at which point we stop. After shimming we learn about the radio frequency source. The RF transmitter consists of frequency synthesizers, amplifiers and associated electronics for producing pulses of highly monochromatic RF electromagnetic radiation with defined phases and amplitudes. The frequency synthesizer is a very important component. It delivers an adjustable frequency for the transmitter which sets the final offset frequency, duration and phase of the RF pulse. This frequency is mixed with a second internal constant frequency called as the intermediate frequency. Electronic mixing of these two frequencies generates the transmitter frequency or carrier frequency of the RF pulse omega RF. Many RF channels will contain an optional waveform generator WFG that allows the production of pulses with arbitrary shapes. The pulse is divided into a number of small segments and each segment possesses its own amplitude and phase. The time dependent amplitude of the pulse is formed according to a shape stored in a waveform memory. The probe is inserted into the bottom of the superconducting magnet and it holds the sample in the center of the magnet. The probe also provides a heater for temperature control of the sample. For temperature regulation, dry air is flown around the sample tube at a rate of 10 to 20 liters per minute after passing an electrical heating element which has a feedback control. A feedback system regulates the temperature of air by controlling the power fed to the heater and the Temperature can be controlled up to 0.1 degree centigrade. Most probes provide a mechanism to allow spinning of the sample at 15 to 25 hertz about the Z axis. Spinning averages facilitate shimming of the magnet, but it is not used for long multidimensional experiments. The probe can also have an alternate airflow for cooling of the probe. The probe also has knobs at the bottom which are connected to resonant circuits for tuning and matching to corresponding nuclei. The next slide this figure shows you schematic of a probe. On the left you see a probe which is a long cylinder. It, it has a protection assembly that you see in blue color. You see in black the flange and below that are screws. Uh, so the probe is inserted into the center and the screws are tightened. Below that what you see are various either connection points that connect to various transmitters or you have uh, points where air is flown and at the bottom, right at the bottom you see uh, three cylindrical knobs and these are used to tune and match various nickels. Tuning and matching of the probe. A characteristic parameter of the probe are circuits is the quality factor Q which describes the damping in the coil circuitry. In general, the higher the Q, the greater the sensitivity and larger the RF field that can be obtained with the given RF power and Q is given as omega L by R. The probe also has an impedance Z which is given as follows. Z is equal to R plus I bracket omega L minus 1 by omega R by omega C bracket closed 
in which omega is the resonant frequency, L is the inductance, R is the resistance of the coil and C is the capacitance of the coil circuit for both of the equations. The electrical properties, specifically capacitance and impedance of these RF coils are sensitive to the sample. So after the sample has been inserted into the probe, the user has to tune the resonant frequency conditions. Tuning optimizes the transfer of power from the transmitter to the excitation coils in the probe. The best sensitivity is obtained when the coil is tuned exactly to the resonance frequency of the individual nuclear species for every sample. This means that if the sample has proton C13 and N15 nuclei, then each of these nuclei have to be separately tuned and matched. In some of the probes, the C13 and N15 are automatically matched and all you have to do is to tune, whereas in some of the probes, there are knobs provided for tuning and matching of all different nuclei. In addition, the coil has to be matched prior to the pulse experiment to the impedance of the transmitter and receiver path which is usually 50 ohms, which is required for optimum transmission of the RF pulses. For most spectrometers, tuning and matching are interdependent and it is necessary to adjust them in an iterative fashion. I should also tell you that many spectrometers these days come with auto tune and match assemblies so that the operator does not have to do it manually, but it is done as automatically. A very important component component of the spectrometer field frequency lock. The field frequency lock system is an arrangement to stabilize to a high degree parts per billion the magnetic field with respect to the radio frequency. This is achieved by permanently measuring the NMR signal of a specific nucleus, typically deuterium and compensating the field for any deviation of this signal from its resonance position by adjusting the current applied to a room temperature shim coil called as the Z0 coil. The lock circuitry is essentially a specifically tuned, usually to deuterium in deuterated solvents, NMR spectrometer that operates in parallel to the main spectrometer. The lock system requires the exact dispersion line which can be obtained by proper adjustment of the phase of the detected signal while the lock level can be adjusted through lock power and gain. So here you see the examples of field frequency lock. The lock circuitry detects the dispersion mode signal of deuterium. This signal has zero voltage precisely at the resonance of the reference compound. On top, you see the lock circuitry and the lock signal from a Bruker spectrometer. It shows the dispersion on the left side and on the right side, it shows a stable lock. The saturation of lock level is taken as 100% and usually for the experiments, the level is set to 70% of saturation level. Lock is adjusted by changing the shim coil current in Z0. On the bottom is the figure a uh, variant or agilent lock signal as you see in their spectrometers. Gradient coils. Modern probes contain actively shielded coils for the application of magnetic field gradients up to 65 gauss per centimeter in the form of pulses in one or three dimensions. That means these are coils that would change the magnetic field very slightly. As you know, the magnetic field strength is say 14.1 Tesla 600 megahertz NMR spectrometer and these coils, they are changing the field by 65 gauss per centimeter. But then it has very good applications. I should also tell that there are gradient coils which can give up to 3000 gauss per centimeter and these coils can be either along or only along z-axis which is more common or you can have gradient coils along all the three axes x, y and z. To obtain gradient strength, these coils are driven with currents which is controlled by a gradient channel 
which includes the gradient control hardware and the pulse uh, gradient amplifier. The development of actively shielded probes that can produce high power field gradient pulses has resulted in new class of experiments that utilize field gradients for coherence selection, for water suppression and for mitigation of radiation damping effects. Modern spectrometers offer gradient shimming procedures which are most effectively used for solutions in water or aqueous solutions with such gradient shimming procedures starting from some standard shim values a good homogeneity on protein samples can routinely be obtained in a few minutes. Here I should tell you that this is referring to the shimming of the magnet. So in shimming we know we have the axial and radial shims but if the spectrometer is equipped with z-axis gradient shims then you can do gradient shimming of the axial shims automatically. That means you can shim from Z1 to Z6 by an automatic procedure which is called as gradient shimming. And where you have X and Y gradients also, there you could do also the X and Y shimming of the radial shims. Now radio frequency coils. The probe contains resonance circuitry with one or more Helmholtz coils which transmit the radio frequency pulses to the sample and subsequently receive the response from the sample. The coil produces a linearly polarized oscillating magnetic field to B1 perpendicular to the main static magnetic field. Depending on the probe, RF circuits may be tuned to a single frequency or may be double tuned to be simultaneously sensitive to two different nuclei. A triple resonance proton C13 N15 probe which is used for assignments of resonance in doubly labeled proteins contains two coils. One coil is double tuned to proton and deuterium for the log system and the other coil is double tuned for C13 and N15. For the broad brand probe, the coil is tunable over a wide frequency range. There are two different arrangements of the proton and heteronuclear coils. In an inverse probe which is designed for direct detection of protons, the proton RF coil is closest to the sample and the heteronuclear RF coils surround the proton coil. In a heteronuclear probe there, that is designed for the direct detection of heteronuclear spins such as C13 and N15, the proton coil is outside of the heteronuclear coil. Positioning the RF coil of the nuclear spin of primary interest closest to the sample provides maximum sensitivity for both excitation of the spins and detection of the signal. Linear amplifier. The amplification and phase of the signal from the frequency synthesizer is under control of the computer. Typical proton and X nuclei amplifiers can have peak output powers in the range of 50 to 100 watt for proton and 300 to 1000 watt for heteronuclei respectively. The amplification levels are specified in decibels of attenuation. A 6 dB decrease in power results in a two-fold decrease in the voltage applied to the sample. This corresponds to a two-fold increase in the pulse length to generate the same flip angle provided the amplifier response is linear. When no RF pulse is applied, the amplifiers are completely blanked. Filter. A filter is in inserted in the transmission path directly before the probe and it forms part of the circuitry. The amplified signal is subject to broadband filtering prior to entering the probe. Example, the proton channel would be filtered to remove frequencies that may interfere with the deuterium lock. When different radio frequencies are applied during an experiment, each channel has to be optimized by inserting a proper bandpass filter between the power amplifier and the probe. The bandpass filter is usually found on heteronuclear channels for example N15 and C13 and filters out undesired frequencies. When heteronuclear decoupling is applied during acquisition, a bandpass filter for the observed frequency must be inserted between the probe and the preamplifier 
to prevent noise created in the decoupling channel from entering into the detection. So with this we have come to the end of this module and let us summarize. A Fourier transform NMR spectrometer consists of an operating workstation, a control console, magnet and a probe. In modern spectrometers, superconducting persistent magnets of field strength up to 23.5 tesla are used. The magnetic field is stabilized with up to 30 room temperature shims that are coupled to a shim power supply. The operating workstation has NMR operation software like Topspin or VJNMR to operate and control the spectrometer. The console has spectrometer computer for the master timing and control of the specific functions of other components like pulse field gradients, frequency synthesizer, shim power supply, waveform generator, analog to digital converter, linear amplifiers and transmission channels. The probe has RF transmission and receiver coils, the field frequency lock coils, temperature and spin controllers and actively shielded pulse field gradient coils. Thank you.